Um, my, my very first question, it is very much connected to some of the work that you have done in, in, in your research. And it's about the countries of the Central American North or Triangle, which they have been long being affected by political instability, social inequality, wars, criminal violence, and in some cases have been further weakened by US interventions in the region over the past 50 years. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be asking you if you can give us uh, two examples of turning points or key events that have been crucial to understand the Central American migration crisis caused largely by above mentioned factors and US military, economic and political interventionism in Central America, Northern Triangle and Nicaragua. Um, so we, we could start maybe with Dr. Lacey Abrego. So I, I want to thank you and, and Elizabeth for the invitation. I'm happy to be in conversation with great scholars and, and I'm looking forward to learning from all of you. Um, I thought about this question a lot because my, my emphasis, my research is mostly on El Salvador and I think about El Salvador's history and it has such a long history of military repression and there are still moments that really I think have marked the the country its people and then and sparked migration um I think about 1932 in La Matanza in which 30,000 mostly indigenous campesinos um peasants were murdered in the span of just a few days and the fact that that kind of unspeakable violence coupled with impunity occurred powerfully silenced people, right? On the one hand, it forced indigenous people to have to hide their identity. Um, and the, you know, the rest of the population understood that resistance and rebellion were not going to be possible. And so there, there's, there was a continued long history of, of repression that continued to happen to different extents, but certainly in the 1970s when um, people started to experience the the hostility from the state against lots of different groups of people in particular, again, racialized people, indigenous people, black people um, in the countryside, as well as teachers and union members of all sorts, countless massacres that took place. And yet there was not still large migration of Central Americans. There, there were always groups of people coming tied to the banana industry, tied to the coffee industry, coming in small numbers for work-related reasons and for tourist reasons. But it wasn't until the early 1980s that you really start to see the larger numbers, especially of Guatemalans and Salvadorans. And in that case, many of the people that I have spoken with discuss the murder of Monsignor Romero. So Oscar Romero now, um, now a saint in the Catholic church as of 2018, I believe, um, was a very popular archbishop in El Salvador who had worked with um, various populations throughout the countryside, really understanding the politics of the moment to be harming the most vulnerable. And he spoke out against it in, in one of his homilies, very directly ordered soldiers to stop the terror against campesinos and was murdered, assassinated the next day on March 24th, 1980. Um, and it, it's very widely known that the assassination was ordered <clears throat> by Roberto Dawison, who was founder and leader of the right-wing party in El Salvador Arena. He was such a beloved member of society. He stood up for the rights of the most vulnerable in very public ways that put him in danger. And when he was murdered, and then when 
thousands of people were attacked during the public funeral in 1980, it was a clear moment of understanding that the repression was only going to get worse and was going to attack attack everybody, right? And, and indeed, that moment opened up a reality that included beheadings and torture and mutilated bodies and all of this in ways that, that were cause widespread trauma for people. So it isn't surprising that within a few years, 400,000 Salvadorans had left the country toward the United States, really establishing what we now see as this broader stream of migration that has continued to the present. Thank you very much for making those connections between the 1932, the 1970s, and 1990s. Uh, so now uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Frank Vitale, uh, can you give us the, the examples that, that you have in mind about this specific uh, U.S. interventionism as a cause of migrations to the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. First, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, I, I I feel very honored to actually be in conversation with Jason and Lacey, and, uh, and I'm really interested to sort of hear how this conversation plays out tonight. Um, and I'm excited for all of the audience's questions as well. Um, so I focus primarily on Honduras. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about Honduras. And I think it's really fitting uh, to have Lacey talk about El Salvador and then talk about Honduras because frequently, um, especially from the United States, there's a kind of uh, eliding of differences of the countries in Central America. And they have really different histories and really different um, trajectories uh, and, and the, the ways in which US interventionism has contributed to the situation on the ground are, are also distinct. So a couple of key points about Honduras is that in the 80s, when uh, other countries in Central America were um, dealing with the United States backing one side, usually the, the state in um, uh, civil wars, in, in popular revolution, um, Honduras served as the staging ground for U.S. counterinsurgency in the region. So the United States talked about Honduras as the USS Honduras, as its, its own aircraft carrier, its battleship um, in the region from which the wars against um, the people of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua could be waged. And so the relationship that the United States has with Honduras is extremely militaristic, but is also sort of um, imperial in that very literal sense, um, going back quite some time. And to this day, the US embassy in, in Honduras has a very direct line um, in terms of determining what kinds of things happen in the country and what kinds of things don't. So there are, uh, I think, in terms of migration history, there's a couple of key moments that, that show that the history of migration is, is different from Guatemala and El Salvador in particular. Um, one of them is that really uh, large scale out migration doesn't really start in Honduras until after Hurricane Mitch in 1998. So it's a little bit later than, the, than its neighboring countries. Um, and it's really in part in response to this devastating hurricane that really destroys both social and, and physical infrastructure in the country. But then there are a couple other key points that also correlate to migration. One is there was a coup d'etat in 2009 that removed the democratically elected president from power. And although the coup wasn't necessarily um, led by the United States, in the aftermath of the coup, the US State Department, led by Hillary Clinton at the time, offered sort of clear support for what were very unfair uh, elections held in the context of a coup d'etat. And the United States sort of put its stamp of approval on those elections and the, the winner, Porfirio Lobo, who became the, the president after, the, uh, after a brief period, then there were elections and, and the coup. And that really was done with the backing of the United States, even as most of Latin America um, very vehemently 
uh, decried the sort of reemergence of military coups in the region and the idea that there could be kind of a, a facade of democracy in that context. So U.S. intervention is, uh, is very much a part of the story there. And then I can fast forward a, a couple of years, uh, almost a decade, to 2017. And this is, I was doing research in Honduras at this time. And in 2017, there were, um, there were presidential elections. The same party that came to power after the coup continued to be in power until that point. And the current, pre the president at the time, Juan Orlando Hernandez, was running for re-election, even though re-election is constitutionally prohibited in Honduras, in the Honduran constitution, that a person cannot serve more than one term. Juan Orlando uh, stacked the Supreme Court to basically rule that that violates an individual's rights, although the constitution remains the same. Um, and he, so he runs for re-election and there is pretty obvious fraud. Um, pretty much everybody agrees that there was fraud in 2017. It was not particularly subtle or particularly unclear. And Juan Orlando stays in power. Um, but he does that really because he's able to do that really because he gets very clear signals from the White House in the United States that he is going to be supported if he declares himself the winner. And he does and he does receive that support. It is not a coincidence that in 2018 is when what has been building for a long time as a kind of exodus of Hondurans really explodes and captures international attention in the sort of aftermath of the fallout of this clearly fraudulent election. I think I can leave it there for now, but there's, there's the clear um, relationship between how the United States um, directs a lot of the sort of priorities of policy in Honduras has everything to do with, with migration. Thank you. Um, I think we can close with this uh, first round of questions with Dr. Jason De Leon. <clears throat> Thank you. I want to just um, echo what everyone else has said. It's, it's really great to be here. I really appreciate the interview, uh, the invitation. I'm glad I get to finally meet Amelia and Lacey. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just going to kind of build on on what Amelia said because um, because um, a lot of my current work sort of focuses on um, Honduras and its relationship to Mexico. Um, and I'll just add a couple of things. Um, you know, we haven't really talked about the Central American Free Trade Agreement and the ways in which um, that has done similar things to the Central American and Dominican Republic economies as it, it as NAFTA has done to, to Mexico, um, making, you know, it's supposed to be a, um, a bilateral trade agreement that really is unilateral in who, who benefits and who does not. Um, you know, Kafka in many ways has made... Um, um, things like peasant farming and impossibility in places like Central America. Um, it's also given people very few um, options for making a living, and um, you know those basically revolve around making Levi's um, for for substandard uh, wages. Um, and so, um, you know, these U.S. trade agreements in these different places make these economies unsustainable for those who are on the ground there, um, which then, of course. It makes blue jeans cheaper for Americans, but then also makes life unlivable for Central Americans who then have to mig migrate out in order to find um, a living wage, which I think oftentimes many Americans just don't understand. Um, and so we could think about the, the trade relationships as having a direct impact on um, on out migration streams. Uh, but also, I, I want to kind of get back to this, this military um, issue that, that Amelia brings up. You know, we could think about in the 80s, as Reagan is waging a, a cold war against um, against uh, Nicaragua and the Sandinistas, right, and very worried about the spread of, of communism, we start dumping millions of dollars into into Honduras to beef up a military that previously was 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 pretty small, um, but suddenly you know they are flooded with money. They end up having more money than than any other wing of of the government, um, and then become this bloated and very and in a very similar way they come to the United States. This very bloated um, um, wing of um, of the federal government that then becomes very good at destabilizing democracy um, and and basically forcing everybody's hand when they are unhappy with, with things that are happening um, um, with uh, with with the current politicians in in place, and so we. We put all this money into the military. We beef them up. We make them stronger than any than anyone else. And we have them do our bidding because we're we're, we're constantly feeding money into them. Um, the military has to um, put butts in seats, and so um, you know they start ramping up the 
kidnapping of young people and conscript and, um, and forced conscription into the military. Um, lots of underage kids end up joining the Honduran military, um, facing all kinds of, of abuses. Um, and I think several generations of people have, have gone through that and have just been completely traumatized, um, both by the fact that you've got this repressive military that's also kidnapping people and in many ways turning a lot of folks into, um, you know, into trained, into trained killers. Uh, those folks then who come out of the military with, with this training have few job opportunities except for working in like illicit markets. And so suddenly um, the, uh, the drug trade is able to find, you know, new soldiers who are able to fill in lots of, um, um, lots of roles for, um, uh, for, for different drug cartels, um, ramping up violence, both in, in Central America um, um, and, and into Mexico, uh, but, and, and making those places unlivable for many, for many folks who were just innocent sort of bystanders. Um, and so as, as drug violence ramps up in response to this increased, you know, role of military and ex-military, you find folks that just can't find a place like Honduras completely unlivable and then, and then must have, have to out-migrate. But the flip side of that is you have the Honduran government and the Honduran military being really primed for um, an American style, style hyper militarization. And so when when 2014 happens, um, when suddenly America takes um, takes notice of the fact that these places are unlivable and that folks are, are coming in masses to the United States, suddenly we have we have a humanitarian crisis. But rather than recognizing that this is a crisis constructed often from um, from U.S. interventionist policies, we think about it ignorantly as a U.S.-Mexico border problem, or increasingly as um, a, a Honduran border problem. And so we start throwing more money at this issue. You know, Obama encourages Mexico to launch Plan Frontera Sur, which then starts to ramp up um, military security across Mexico to make it difficult for Central Americans to get across. But then also you have um, a heavy U.S. Border Patrol presence now in Honduras, training Honduran government um, uh, agents to catch their own people and keep them in country. Um, so you've got things like the elite GOET team that Obama sponsored and has a direct line to the um, American embassy that are basically patrolling their northern border um, to catch uh, both folks coming from farther south and, and elsewhere, but as well as trying to catch um, unaccompanied minors and, and single parents leaving with their kids who are, who are trying to escape the country. But they're catching it at the behest of the United States government and with training and logistics logistical infrastructure that the U.S. has provided. Um, so these things, I mean, as everyone has said here, I mean, it's this deep, deep history that I think many folks really either don't understand or completely gloss over, as Emilia was saying, and, and generalize and, and, uh, and think that, that Honduras, Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, that all these places are, have the exact same histories and therefore face the same problems. But I think that, um, you know, there, there's very unique circumstances in each of these places that then create, um, you know, particular reasons for, for people um, having to out-migrate. So going to uh, following the, the conversation in terms of um, now that we have been talking about the US interventionism in Central America, I wanna move forward with um, the situation that is experienced, the vulnerability and the risks of the effects of US immigration policies on migrants' clandestine northward journeys and, and the impact of, of these policies on the behaviors, the conducts, and the daily routines of undocumented immigrants. So I'm gonna be asking you very specific examples from your research of the human consequences of US immigration policy as they can be seen uh, in the work of Jason de Leon in the Sonoran Desert of Arizona, in the Central American caravans that uh, Amelia Frank has been uh, doing research and has been following and accompanying and also in the experience of Salvadoran transnational families in the case of the research by Lacey Abrego. So I guess we can start with, um, with Jason this time uh, to, to give you uh, the opportunity to talk about how these US immigration policies are being experienced in, in, in the context of your research in the north, northward journeys of undocumented Central American migrants. Sure, sure. Um, well, I think, you know, something else to consider is the fact that, um, you know, migrants coming from places farther south than Mexico have a fundamentally different kind of experience than um, than, than Mexicans who are migrating to the United States. And I won't um, get into those details because I know Amelia will talk about, you know, what's happening in, in Mexico. But I think something just to keep in mind, um, because folks are coming up, you know, from the south and... And Central Americans now, when, when they get to the U.S.-Mexico border, um, at least in, in, you know, in recent years, you know, the attempt has been to apply for asylum because many of those folks are 
are refugees and I think in, in so many ways should qualify for, for um, political asylum because of various um, persecutions that, that they are facing. Um, you know, many of those folks, unlike a lot of Mexican migrants, are not trying to, to initially cross the U.S.-Mexico border through South Texas or through um, um, the Sonora Desert of Arizona. Many of them are coming to the U.S. and asking for um, for legal asylum, trying to go through the process. And of course, with policies like remain in Mexico or then being sent back to Mexico and forced to stay in these horrendous refugee camps, where the idea is that um, if we make them wait long enough, they will be deterred either because it'll be because of the harassment and the persecution by by local government officials, cartels, a whole range of actors who are who are invested in exploiting migrants. That folks will then give up and, and turn around and head back home. Many of those folks who I think had never anticipated um, trying to cross through a place like the Sonoran Desert get so frustrated by having to wait in these refugee camps that then they finally get so desperate that they then will attempt the journey through um, a place like southern Arizona, where thousands of people have died um, uh, during that crossing because of the exposure to things like extreme temperature and all of the other dangers that, uh, that nature um, has, in, has in store for them. And so, you know, I think that the human consequences are we keep forcing people's hands in different ways um, and and they are putting themselves, we are putting them in harm's way and or at least setting up a system in which they have no other choice but to then directly, in, you know, run run these, these dangerous um, gauntlets. And, I, you know, I, I think we need to consider, you know, so there's a policy prevention through deterrence that went into place officially in 1994. You know, simply it's an attempt to use um, the natural environment to deter migrants. And so by making it impossible to do a border a border crossing in an urban zone, people will try to cross in, in a place like South Texas or um, or in, you know, or in Arizona. And because of that, um, you know, and that's the primary security paradigm that's in place right now, even though we've never heard a president in the last four um uh, administrations utter that phrase out loud and publicly, but yet it's we're, we're still using the environment to um, you know to brutalize folks, and I think all these other things that are happening, the remain in Mexico, the the ramped up enforcement in um, in uh, in Mexico by by Mexican immigration officials, uh, Honduran uh, border agents patrolling at the border and trying to keep people in country. I think all of those are natural outgrowths of this. Of these different forms of deterrence that are basically just trying to brutalize migrants in as many ways as possible to prevent them from from moving um, and so we can think about you know i think we need to think about the experiences that, that border crossers have or migrants have as not something that can be isolated at the u.s mexico border i think america americans really were so fixated on this geopolitical boundary not understanding that that the migration experience can go months or or, or, or years in, in some cases and that people are facing abuses at every single you know, step of the way. Um, so I really think we need to broaden our understanding of the migration process to really go back to the home country and then think about all the steps that must happen before even someone gets to the point where they're at the U.S.-Mexico border. Thank you for, for reminding us about that. Um, just today we were discussing in a class on perspectives of migration, how these journeys in so many cases became completely, uh, that these are not linear uh, journeys that they may take several months, even years, you know, for some different situations that you have described very well. So I, I want to ask now, uh, Professor uh, Amelia Frank Vitale, uh, you have been following the caravans from Honduras, which is like a very interesting way of migrating, which creates more safety for the members of the caravan. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the kind of work in relationship with, with these specific questions on the risks due to the uh, US immigration policies on, on these migrants' clandestine journeys? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think migrant caravans um, make very visible something that is already happening all the time in different ways and less visible ways, um, but bring a kind of spotlight to, to these social processes. So in terms of how U.S. policy shapes this, first I want to say, and I want to be really clear about this, that people do not leave Honduras because they think the United States is going to let them in. There is a lot of misinformation about how the caravans were organized around the midterm elections or um, the caravans were organized to destabilize the Democrats or the caravans were organized to uh, take advantage of Joe Biden becoming president or, or whatever. That is not what is happening. Um, and I think we have to be very careful about imputing on people in the rest of the world the kind of 
importance that we imagine US politics to have. Um, people in Honduras are already ready to go. Most of the folks from Honduras that I talked to in the 2018 caravan were one step away from leaving already. They were trying to get the money together for a coyote. They were trying to figure out how to go without a coyote. They were waiting for a cousin. They were waiting for someone to send them money. They were, they were just waiting for one thing to change. And they saw on Honduran news, news about the groups of people gathering at the bus station. And that's when they decided to leave. They thought, this is my chance. Um, and I, I, so I think we really have to rethink what what we're talking about when we're talking about sort of people making decisions based on what's going on in the United States because it's that's that's not what's going on with with most migration decisions um, and certainly not with the caravans. The other thing is that the caravans emerge as a response to the consequences of the encroaching deterrence policy that Jason is talking about. So the very first migrant caravan um, of, of people migrating, not of parents of migrants or mothers of migrants, but of people migrating was in 2011. Um, and it was a very small thing that went from a place called Arriaga in Chiapas in Southern Mexico to Ixtepec in Oaxaca in the next state. It's a length of highway that takes about three and a half hours to drive, but on the train it takes about, and many people were traveling on the tops of freight trains at the time, takes took about 12 to 14 hours at that time. And at the time, um, the train was being assaulted by all sorts of groups of people, including people involved in the Mexican police forces, pretty much like clockwork every two months. Um, and so a group of human rights advocates, clergy, um, journalists, uh, academic activisty people like myself um, came together to, to do a caravan. That was the idea that sort of emerged and drawing on sort of protest repertoires in Mexico of, of caravans as a thing to draw attention to a social issue. And so we all went to Arriaga and the idea was to literally accompany people, right? To literally walk beside people um, to get them to the next spot safely by drawing attention to it, by drawing press attention, by having more of a spotlight on, on what was happening, and then also to help people move uh, towards their destination. Um, so it kind of combines this idea of accompaniment and protest, and then making demands on the Mexican state to protect the rights of people who are trying to transit across its territory. And from that group of about 300 people moving across three hours of highway to you know, uh, seven years later in 2018, about 10,000 people moving all across Mexico, that that grows that as a kind of tactic and strategy to try and get across Mexico safely emerges and develops over that nearly a decade, in part because Mexico is doing the bidding of the United States to make it harder and harder to get across Mexico. But as deterrence in the southern in the southern United States has never worked to actually stop people from trying to migrate, it doesn't work in Mexico. And what it does instead is push people into more dangerous situations to push people into like the literal margins of the highways and the towns. Um, whereas in 2010, people would often ride on top of freight trains. Now people walk across half of Mexico. Um, literally walk across half of Mexico and most of it through really remote areas, which makes them more vulnerable to organized crime, to all sorts of violences, um, and also the physical depletion that that, that that entails. And so the caravans grow and develop as a strategy to get across Mexico in a way that is more safe and also that um, is potentially less expensive because the other alternative is to rely on the networks of coyotes who know how to get you across Mexico uh, more safely. It is worth noting though that, you know, that as a strategy and as a tactic is running up against a newly militarized Mexican enforcement regime um, in, the, in the form of the Guardia Nacional, which has um, really uh, no longer uh, 
maintain the concern with respecting human rights, at least publicly, that had been the case in Mexico um, and has become very, very violent in its um, efforts to stop uh, more recent caravans that have formed. And the United States has also uh, relied now on the Guatemalan military and the Guatemalan police to stop caravans before they even get to Mexico. Um, so the strategy of caravan as a way to manage the, the, the externalization of borders is not something that I'm sure is going to be particularly successful um, for much longer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was just remembering what the former Tsar of the Obama administration, Alan Bersin, mentioned once in 2014 or 2015, the US-Mexico border starts now in Guatemala and Central America with Mexico uh, in, in relationship to what you have just been describing uh, these kind of policies that have been implemented in Mexico to, to deter migration and to increase the risks of undocumented Central Americans in transit. So uh, we're now gonna be focusing on, on this, how immigration policies, how they are affecting immigrants living in, in the United States, specifically in their kind of research that Professor Lacey Arrigo is doing with uh, transnational Salvadoran families. Thank you, yeah. I um, will start by saying in terms of US policies and how they affect the day-to-day -day lives of families, it was really interesting to witness the US public's reactions to the Trump administration's policies that so unapologetically and just so explicitly targeted migrants and their families. And, and then this kind of like movement around the hashtag of families belong together, you know, rose up. And it was fascinating to watch because people understood in that moment that U.S. immigration policies are harmful. And I felt like the whole time I was, you know, wherever anyone would listen, this has been going on for so long. You know, this is just the current iteration and families have so often not had what becomes a privilege of being together when you're in those circumstances. In the cases that um, I wrote about, I was talking to people who migrated from El Salvador in the 1980s and the 1990s. And in those cases, it was also US immigration policy that prevented them from being with their families. Um, one, because they were funding the military to commit the atrocities against human rights that everyone lived through, right? Two, because while funding and training and arming the military to do these things, um, the representation of what was happening was a much more benign one where the U.S. was involved in, you know, <clears throat> getting rid of anarchists and communists and, and people who were going to be a threat to the U.S. economy and to, to their um, understanding of what a good life <clears throat> is. And so they they presented their work reagan in particular as as being about helping to stabilize the region when in fact they were doing the opposite so when hundreds of thousands of people are leaving the very place where they are funding that harm they can't accept that so they don't grant um, especially in the 80s, Guatemalan and Salvadoran migrants, refugee status or asylum, right? Very, very few asylum applications were, <clears throat> were accepted um, in the early 1980s from people from those groups. And so it meant that most people were having to migrate without any kind of visa, were having to migrate to a country where they were considered to be unlawfully present. And so the dangers are at the time of migrating through land, through Mexico, um, were maybe less severe than they are now, but there were always dangers. So people chose to leave their, ch chose, you know, because they had no other option, left children behind. And because it's multiple borders that they're crossing, these borders that are increasingly militarized, 
it was impossible for them to return home, visit family, bring their kids. So those family separations lasted many, many years. And lots of the um, interviews that I conducted, people had not seen each other in over a decade. That's just how families had to live because the goal was for parents to migrate, find a way to survive and send whatever remittances they could. And immigration policy never allowed them to legalize their status to then bring their children legally. And so the thought of bringing your child with, you know, with a coyote or with under some other kind of unlawful way, you knew you were putting them in direct danger, right? So people did it, but it wasn't at the kind of massive scale that we're starting to see now as conditions in Central America continue to become more and more and more unsafe, untenable, unlivable, right? Now in 2014, you're starting to see more more, um, images of of young mothers coming with young children, right? Not leaving their children behind anymore, but then facing um, another kind of family separation that had to do with where parents were being detained. If they came with a father, they were separated from a father then. If they came with their mother, they would be placed in detention with their mothers and um, conditions that led many to try suicide attempts and all kinds of horrible things that people lived through. Um, and so again, this, this Trump moment when people are, are, you know, out there actually paying attention and caring about this and saying families belong together, it was also a moment of saying yes, but, you know, not in detention or not under the conditions that have been created by lots of previous administrations, not just this one. So I'll leave it there just about these particular moments, but we can talk a whole lot more about U.S. immigration policy and migrants in the U.S. So the, the next question, just to close this three round uh, before we uh, start reading some of the questions from the audience, is very much connected to what Professor Lacey Arrebo was saying, and maybe we can continue with, with, your, um, with your response. How is the legality of some immigrant communities linked to their race and ethnicity? Uh, can you give us like some examples of expression of the racialized illegality of Central American immigrants in the United States? And hopefully you can explain how they have been rooted in historical and context specific processes, these uh, racializations of illegality. Yeah, so th this is an area that I think more and more scholars are starting to really deepen on and and the way that I'm understanding it at the moment is really um, based on an experience of having grown up in the Southwest. There, there is a racialization process of Central American migrants and illegality in a very particular way um, that is not the same as other groups that maybe have been racialized it, along the ideas of being cheap labor, exploitable labor, right? Um, Central Americans, particularly Salvadorans, Hondurans, Guatemalans are, are thought of in different historical moments in the US as various forms of crisis, right? You have Ronald Reagan talking about these anarchists who are at our borders and we have to protect ourselves. You know, this region is closer to us than all of our other enemies and we have to keep it. Um, under control, basically, the, the images that he shared in all of his speeches about who these people were that were coming were all about violence, um, all about a, a just a kind of um, inherent sort of violence that, that is about threatening the entire capitalist system that the United States reveres, right? And so I, I recall that just growing up in LA that there were these ideas even among other Latino groups that Salvadorans had other issues. You know, we were communists and that was suspect in a way that not everyone was. Um, and then, you know, each, each administration has, has understood Central Americans as, as crisis in different ways and used that justification um, to intervene militarily in Panama, for example, or to, to continue um, 
their various forms of intervention in the region. <clears throat> More recently, the crisis came in 2014. The crisis, as the Obama administration portrayed it, was really a, a, the, at some points called the humanitarian crisis. He talked about the violence that surrounded them in their journey, and then deterrence was used. Deterrence in that sense, um, an expansion, a vast expansion of the detention system, especially for families, um, was used to, to send the message to other folks not to come because you're going to be detained in these terrible conditions, right? So that kind of crisis under the Trump administration, there they were portrayed as this crisis um, that posed a national threat. You know, Trump talked about um, gangs always, you know, as the Central American issue on several occasions, um, portraying Mexico and the U.S. as allies against Central Americans, right? So that crisis continues. We're seeing it now again. The racialization of Central Americans then, if you then start to look at popular culture, because there isn't a whole lot of representation, the very, very, very limited representations of Central Americans for women are these like sassy or kind of, you know, slightly insane um, domestic workers, you know, domesticating them. So they're good workers, they're, they're a little unstable, but you can deal with them. Um, and the men are just inherently and irredeemably violent. All of these media portrayals in popular culture are that way. So there, there's, this is an area that's being developed, but I think those are kind of the lines of how Central Americans have been racialized. And then the, the illegalized part of that happened through policies and, and makes people, you know, when half of your, your co-nationals have no legal protections to reside here, it affects the entire community's ability to thrive in the country. Thank you very much for, for such an, an interesting approach, depending on the specific US administrations, the different ways that we can think about these racialization processes. Uh, Jason De Leon, uh, we continue with you and we can close with uh, Amelia Frank Vitale with, with this section. Yeah, I'll just you know kind of add that we need to think about migration as a highly racialized space. I think that people really gloss over that, including scholars of migration who, I mean, you know, for the longest time, like if you were to look at the history of what social scientists have written about migration from Latin America, United States, you would think that it's only Mexican males who migrate, um, you know, that has, I mean, and, and granted that for the longest time, that was the majority of people, but there's, there have always been Central American migrants um, migrating and there, and, and there have, there have always been a, a much more diverse the, the diversity of those groups is also much deeper than people would, would have you imagine. Um, it's only, I think, now with this increase in Central American migration, it's becoming more obvious as people who are looking at this thing, um, especially journalists who become shocked when they see a black person migrating and not understand that there are a lot of black people in Honduras um, and in you know Belize and in Guatemala and in Mexico, um, and that, that those folks experience migration in a radically different way than, you know, their, their white mestizo, um, you know, uh, counterparts. And so we have to think about, you know, phenotypes, skin color, think about indigeneity within the migration context. All of these things are impacting how people experience it. And, um, you know, and Central Americans, you know, as Lacey's saying, like, they face so much discrimination. Um, and it really, you know, you see it in the US in terms of the way in which people, you know, Trump and others have talked about um, my, you know, about migrants from 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 Central America, you see it in Mexico, um, the way in which Mexicans talk about Central Americans and the, 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 the stereotypes and the tropes about, you know, they're all violent gang members, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so I think we need to understand that the migration, like when people leave Central America, and, and every country that they must go through, they're experiencing some, you know, they're, they're experiencing things differently than, um, 
than folks from those home countries. You know, so having to go through through you know Honduras talk about the brutality of having to go through Guatemala um, and the and the racism that they experience there, um, and then the, exper the the racism that that Hondurans face in in Mexico um, because they're assumed to be you know everyone's an MS13 or if they're if they're Afro Honduran or Garifuna you know they're assumed to you know then they then Mexicans are carrying in these tropes that these you know racist tropes that that American popular media perpetuates about black people. Um, so all of this stuff is kind of built into this, but we really just never get a sense of, of what it actually looks like um, on the ground. And, it's, um, and I think that, you know, I know there was a question about, about Haitian, um, this photo of, 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 of Haitian, um, of a Haitian man being, being attacked by the Border Patrol agent on, on horseback. That's only shocking to the, to, because there's a photograph of it, but those things have been happening, you know, for, since the, the founding of the Border Patrol, you could swap out Haitian migrants for Chinese migrants, um, and we can think about the racialized experiences of, of migrants, and you can also just, you know, if you take a, a broader look around, you see that, that people are, um, you know, the way in which Mexicans are being treated is radically different from the ways in which Central Americans are, are, being, are being treated, and you even see it in the physical movement across Mexico. So, Garifuna are oftentimes they're trying to get to, to New Orleans, they're trying to get to to New York or Houston, to to to, to places with with large black populations where they're able to where there, where there are um, Afro Honduran communities there, or where it's much easier for them to sort of blend in phenotypically. You've got um, you know mestizo Central Americans oftentimes going to a place like Los Angeles, California, where um, where where there's large communities of, of of folks who look just like them. But you even see those those routes you know happening w within Mexico. You know, along these 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 highly racialized um, um, uh, routes, and then also it impacts the way in which people, exp um, you know, even the um, the smuggling routes. So Afro Hondurans tend to get smuggled by by other Afro Hondurans who have strong connections to transnational gangs like Bloods and Crips. Mestizo Hondurans tend to migrate with those who who with other mestizos typically who are in MS13, and they have their own their own routes, and um, they're they're paying different different fees, and they're they're using different different ways to get across the country, and and l largely to avoid you know Mexican immigration. Um, so the, the the racial question is a huge one that we I think are only starting to really scratch the surface now. Thank you, Jason. So we we finished with you, Amelia, and then we uh, can read some of the questions that we have received from from the audience. Great. Yeah. Um, I just building off what both Lacey and Jason said, I'll just add a couple of things. One that, you know, illegalization of people um, contributes to the kinds of violences of racialization that we're talking about. So in Mexico because Central Americans are illegalized in their journeys across Mexico, that pushes them into these vulnerabilities based on their, it, it's not based on their nationalities, based on their lack of, of legal standing that gets read through the lens of, of racialization, right? Um, I was in a shelter for Central Americans many years ago in Northern Mexico, but not all the way at the border in Saltillo and Coahuila. And a man from the border um, from I think Reynosa, would come down to the shelter and give a talk about safety to the Central Americans, about what you need to do when you go to the Northern border, when you're ready to make the crossing. And one of the things he would tell them is, when you go to a hotel, you go to a little, these little, little hotels where people spend a couple of nights while they're trying to wait for the right moment to cross, he would say, give a Mexican sounding name. Say your name is Maria or Jose. Do not say you're named Kelvin or William or uh, I broad ideas, but I am about like uh, broad ideas about Central American names versus Mexican names. The reason being because the organized crime groups that control border crossing, that control these 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 territories, will go to the hotels, look at the list of names, see who Central Americans are, and and kidnap them for ransom. And the idea being that because people are in this space, because they are Central American and they do not have legal status in this space, they are vulnerable they, to be targeted for kidnapping. There's a whole industry of kidnapping Central Americans in, in Mexico, but there's a very specific targeting of them because of their Central Americanness. Uh, so that sort of process of illegalization and the, the way that that intersects with racialization is, is not unique to the United States and is also occurring elsewhere. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that building off what Lacey said about the, the way in which Central American men are just portrayed as inherently uniquely violent. So in Honduras, young, poor, urban men 
are also deeply stigmatized and criminalized. The, their own government, their own society in many cases, sees these young men as also inherently likely criminally violent, as, as likely, um, as even if they're not gang members, as people who will eventually become gang members or are somehow predisposed to it, as opposed to understanding that, that gangs are a consequence of other situations in society. But that sort of experience of marginalization and criminalization um, begins at home. It starts within Honduras in this case and moves with people, especially young men, as they move through these circuits of migration um, and try to access even humanitarian aid. They are viewed with suspicion, viewed as likely criminal, as likely violent as they go through Mexico. And then, talking about trying to access asylum, these same systems of international protection also view Central American men as more likely to be perpetrators of violence rather than victims, even though they are most likely to be murdered if deported. And so the, the experience that there's an experience of marginalization, of criminalization that people already know before they ever set foot out of their country. And that gets exacerbated and then compounded with a criminalized racialization as they migrate through these circuits and are usually likely deported. Thank you very much for, for responding to these three questions. So we're now in, in the process of reading some of the comments, some of the questions from the audience. We have several of them, so I'm gonna be just reading a few. So um, this is something coming from Mayra Reimao. Uh, can you speak about the relationship between these Central American countries? Amelia spoke about the unique position of Honduras as a base of US military action. And Jason mentioned the border with Mexico. But I was wondering about the borders between these Central American countries. Are they porous? Are they tense? Does the violence cross borders? Or are there any unique groups on each side? Attitudes of governments and citizens with respect to potential migrants from neighboring Central American countries, etc. Um, as you mentioned, these countries are unique. They have their own histories, their own economies. So how do they operate between each other or is the relationship more US and Mexico facing? So who would like to, to answer that question? I mean, I, yeah. I, I can just say partially that, so this is an interesting point about how the United States has really, really interfered in local border politics in Central America. So in Central America, there is an agreement among four countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua, that guarantees freedom of movement for adults across those four borders. Sort of like the EU, sort of. Um, but the CA4 countries have, have that agreement. Now, be, which means that with just your ID, with just your regular government issued ID, which everyone, mostly has in Central America, you can go back and forth across across borders within Central America. Um, Mexico is not included in that. Um, but because of the Un United States' real interest in fortifying border controls, um, that's become much more fraught. And they've really focused on children. So if you're under 18, you can't do that. You have to actually have a passport to be able to travel and you have to travel with at least one parent and the written permission of the other parent. Um, and so that has become a space where the U.S.'s interest in monitoring movement and keeping people contained um, has been kind of enacted through the border controls. Um, the other part of that is that the Honduran government, at least, doesn't actually want to contain people, doesn't actually want to keep its population in Honduras. And as it is a regime that is deeply corrupt on many different levels, although it is willing to take the money from the United States and to, on the surface, do the things that the United States would like it to do at its border, it is also at the same time uh, encouraging and facilitating clandestine exit from Honduras. <laughs> 
I'm not sure if Jason or, or Lacey would like to, to add something. Uh, we have several questions, so if, if you want, we can move with the next one. So this, this is gonna be, uh, I think, very important for Lacey and, and, and Jason also. So where do you see Central American studies going? This comes from Julie Alvarenga. We have seen Dr. Abrego's efforts in UCLA along with the backlash she has faced. It seems that we can form unions, solidarity in Caribbean studies, given our geographic location, historic similarities, and with what we're witnessing at the border with people from IT and countries in Central America, such as Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. So I, I think that the question is, uh, where do you see Central American studies going? Uh, and, and obviously you are working at UCLA, which is uh, uh, the best place or one of the best places to, to study uh, these uh, kind of topics that we have been discussing today. Hi, Julie. Yeah. Um, where do I see it going? I mean, it's it's this moment where there's been a growth of interest, academic interest in the region and in migrants here from the region. Um, in your question about whether it makes more sense to be in solidarity with Caribbean studies. Yeah, absolutely, right? The way that academia functions, however, doesn't really allow for the space to be super intentional about those things. Um, it's just kind of like the right place, the right moment, the right funds, the right people have to all come together for these things to happen. And as as it's developing, at least on the West Coast, uh, we share so many experiences with Mexican and Chicanx communities in terms of where we live, where we go to school, where we work, um, that it makes sense for, for Southern California, certainly, to think of these groups as having a whole lot of shared experiences, particularly with the more recent migrants from Mexico, right? The, the population, the students that I teach, um, students will always say, especially from Southern Mexican states, um, they will say they there's much more of an affinity with one another among Central Americans and Oaxacans and people from Guerrero and people from Chiapas um, than there is with folks who have been here three, four, five, six generations who are far removed from that experience of migration and have gone through similar kinds of structural conditions. The, the policies have affected them similarly, right? And so they've witnessed the militarization of the border that hasn't allowed for cyclical migration, even in the Mexican case. Um, so there, there's a lot of similarities that make sense at a place like UCLA to have these groups together here, where I can completely imagine that on the East Coast, um, it would make complete sense to have Central American studies with Caribbean studies. And honestly, even at UCLA, the, the organized Central American students are, are really working in that way of, of trying to think broadly about who's included here, about talking about Haiti, talking about the Caribbean um, and all of the ties to Central America. Um, so, so that might happen. It was just in this particular moment, this is what made sense in, in our department at least. You know, and I'll just add that I, I think that there is so much synergy in Southern California for for Central American studies, and you know, and 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 thankfully, you know, UCLA and the department has really picked up on that and and understands it. You know, we have a, a, an enormous student body that um, has had historically very little representation, and um, and it's not. I think it's not just the you know an institutional issue, although I think that that is part of it. Um, you know, I think in terms of like the research side of things, there's a lot of romance to working in Mexico. There's a lot of romance to working along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, you know, the um, it takes a lot more work to do field work in Central America. You really have to want to be there. And I think that um, it, in in a lot of ways, it um, it's good and bad. I think it's bad in that it um, 
it, it, it's, it's hard for people. There's not enough discussion about the importance of working there for people who I think aren't already gravi gravitating towards it. And, you know, and the, oftentimes the students that gravitate towards it are, are students of Central American origin um, or have some connection. Um, but, you know, I would say 100 percent of the white students that that email me that want to do social science research on migration, they want to work in Mexico or they want to work on the U.S.-Mexico border. And um, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the, we don't need any more people working on the U.S. Mexico border. I mean, it's saturated. I mean, it's just. I mean, it's 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 to the point where. I mean, it's kind of become like Oaxaca in the '90s. You throw a rock and you're going to hit an anthropologist. Um, and so, you know, for me, it, it's it's really important to push onto students that like, look, there are huge important questions that we need to be asking, and many of them can be asked in in interesting ways in in Central America. And so, I think it's really, you know, one of the one of the I think goals that we need to have for Central American Studies is to um, is to really push that um, beyond. I mean, at UCLA, there's lots of students who come because their parents are from are from these places, or they themselves are, or they're you know they they've grown up in these communities here. But I think um, you know we just haven't had enough support for scholarship that's working on this. And you and you see it like with you know when when people are hiring migration scholars, and you have the Central American you know migration scholar and you have the U.S. Mexico border scholar. I mean. People want the, you know, the U.S.-Mexico border is the is the flashy stuff that's going to get you on, you know, in the news kind of thing. People, there's like that, unfortunately, that romance of it. Whereas this other stuff, you know, it's it's really, um, un, it's 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 not un, understandable for a lot of folks. And so I think we really need to push back against that. And that's a that's you know that's a real uphill battle to um, um that's going to just take us training more students, um and to making more inroads and and to and to being, um. You know, having these kinds of conversations where, you know, I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, I think, you know, we were we weren't having these conversations 10 years ago, despite the fact that the same thing was going on. And I was just thinking what you have just said in terms of my field of research, Mexican studies, having to expand also to understand and have dialogues with Central American studies, migration studies scholars, is part of this kind of important interdisciplinarity that we're trying also to, to highlight here at, at Villanova University. We, we have another question, uh, and this uh, comes from Francisco Sanchez. How do you understand the recent incorporation of Haitians and Venezuelans to the migration trail through Central America? For example, they're crossing the Darien jungle between Colombia and Panama. Thank you for this insightful conversation. The question is open for anybody here. So how are we um, understanding, how are you understanding the recent incorporation of Haitians and Venezuelans to the migration trail through Central America? Um, so I, I was just in Mexico a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to some of my um, colleagues and friends and fellow activists, anthropologists, people um, who had just been in Tapachula, where in Tapachula is, is Southern Mexico. It's right on the border with Guatemala. It's sort of the first city after the border with Guatemala in a particular part of Chiapas. Um, and it's the home of, it's one of the major homes of the Mexican agency that adjudicates uh, refugee claims, Comar. Um, and so uh, I, I wasn't in Tapachula, but I was talking to some people who had just come back from Tapachula and they were talking to um, the thousands of people from Haiti who are in Tapachula. And the the Haitian migration through Mexico is very, very different than the kinds of dynamics that the Central American migration through Mexico um, it, it we've documented, we've talked about, we understand, and and you know it's always changing. But but this is a different uh, a different situation. Um, many of the folks from Haiti who are currently in Mexico have not left Haiti recently. They have left Haiti. They left Haiti quite a few years ago and had um, set up some sort of, they, they developed lives elsewhere. Um, many of them are from Brazil and Chile. Um, and there was some understanding that something had changed in, uh, in the possibility of, I, I'm hesitant to say this too much based on what I just said about Honduran migration, right? But this is what people are reporting, that, that these ideas of TPS that had changed in the United States got filtered into communities who had already been residing outside of, outside of Haiti um, as there was a possibility of, of being able to get to the United States. And what they've encountered in Mexico 
is extraordinary hostility, extraordinary violence. Um, the images from the US-Mexico border are really a fraction of the, the violence that Haitians are subjected to in Southern Mexico. Um, and a lot of people are saying, if we would have known what was gonna happen here, we would never have left. Um, there's a lot, there's many fewer sort of networks in relationship to the activist structures in Mexico that have tended to support the migration of Central Americans in different ways. Um, and there's, but the Mexican government is also making it very clear that the Haitians are not going to be able to access refugee status in Mexico because they had some sort of status in mostly Brazil and Chile. Um, and so people are really in a kind of limbo where they can't really be deported, they can't really move forward. They also aren't, for the most part, being uh, aren't um, able to access any kind of status in Mexico, which creates a, a whole different kind of issue for, for this community. And I just saw um, earlier today that for the first time, Haitians are the highest number of people soliciting refugee status in Mexico this last quarter, um, higher than Hondurans who had had the highest rates um, recently. I would just add that it's important to just say out loud, right, that so much of it is about anti-Blackness, about yes. Haitians migrating to Chile, for example, which I'm a little bit more familiar with, um, in a moment when there was no migration policy that should have acted to kick them out, right? But that happened anyway, even when... Um, non-Black migrants are coming from lots of other places not facing the same kind of situation where they're being, they're finding ways to come up with policies to kick people out, specifically Haitians. The case in Brazil where they were welcomed to be laborers for a while and then, and then kicked out, right? And um, so I, it's just important to recognize that part of it in the midst of this. And I don't, I don't know, I'd be interested um, to learn about whether folks are looking at um, Garifuna migrants, other Black migrants from the region, what is their treatment comparatively, um, understanding that, that this is really at the core of their experience. Yeah, yeah, I think another factor is that Chile has really used the pandemic as an excuse, as a pretext to harden its borders and revoke status from all sorts of people, not just Haitians, but that also coincides with this, um, with this current dynamic. We have another question. I think this is um, a very open question for anybody. Uh, could you discuss the current administration, immigration policies, and Kamala Harris in, in Guatemala? Um, what's your intake about what we're seeing now with the Biden administration? So Jason, Amelia, Daisy. Yeah, there's the, uh, what's the, what's the who song? Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. <laughs> um, you know, I think there's just a lot of bullshit. I think that we've been sold a bill of goods and, uh, and looky, looky, remain in Mexico is, is still going on. Um, you know, people are still in detention. Uh, they don't need, um, black and brown votes at the moment so that they can they can put us on the back burner um you know i, I think that that we are that, Im that immigration and our and these long-standing problems that we have have been put on the back burner and um you know and obviously we're, we're dealing with with right now with things like like climate change but a total failure to recognize the relationship between climate change and migration um you know so we're, we're, we're sort of attacking these these policies piecemeal and um and I mean, this is the problem. I think that we are um, we're ranking them in order of what we think is most important. And, and it's clear that right now the administration does not think that immigration is a, is is important. And it it doesn't surprise me because it, it really just fits into this American perspective that we can treat immigration as something that happens in a political, social, and environmental vacuum. Like, oh, that's this other thing. It has nothing to do with with foreign policy. It has nothing to do with climate change. So we'll deal with it separately. Um, and so I, I think that you know this administration. I'm not surprised. Um, you know, I think for a lot of folks, as long as Trump isn't isn't, you know, they're not using, they're doing a lot of the, many of the same things that Trump was doing. So they're just not using the language that he was that he was using, right? So um, so we somehow think it's 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 better, um, but 
I can't think of anything more ignorant than standing in, in Guatemala and telling a room full of people in an entire country to just, just to not come, like as if that's somehow going to work. Um, so I think we need to be um, we need to be putting the screws to these people. Um, and we need to be really, you know, I think people were angry at this last this last election cycle. Um, clearly, last night's um, election results are showing that um, that that if Democrats want to keep pushing forward with various agendas, they're going to need to come back and um, and make good on a bunch of promises because uh, because right now, um, you know, this country is is still ripping apart, even though the the things that are happening in the White House just have a you know a, a sort of nicer um, veneer on them. There was this, I was just going to say there was this moment during the Trump administration when Pence visited Guatemala and made this, you know, the speech that made me feel physically ill where he's, he's saying, you know, to the people, please understand that we've always respected your borders and your sovereignty and you need to respect ours don't come you know and I, I put that on a slide I just I couldn't believe that you know he was saying this I mean obviously I, I believe it but it just feels so jarring understanding the history of U.S. intervention in the region and then you know seeing Kamala Harris and hearing her speech was like I, I'm just gonna keep adding you know slides to this presentation because the the narrative continues to be exactly the same this search for um what they call root causes and I, you know we we know what these are uh, but they're very very persistent very consistent in their messaging about U.S. just you know minding its own business and, and not being involved in the region and just having to deal with all these people coming to our borders. Yeah, just to pick up on that, the root causes, you know, the there was that uh, the discourse at some point in the Biden administration that we, we weren't going to focus on the U.S.-Mexico border, we were going to focus on root causes. And that is also cause for concern in my mind, because the United States has often done work around root causes of migration, including under the Obama administration led by Biden, that results in a kind of U.S. idea of what aid looks like that creates more conditions that lead to more migration. Like the U.S. version of what is needed, the U.S. idea of how they can help uh, communities in Central America imposes um, all kinds of ideas about what is what is necessary and what is good and what people should be doing and what kinds of jobs people should have and how people should make money and what kind of structural reform should happen in Central America based on a US lens and a, and a very neoliberal capitalist idea um, that often creates St further structural problems that contribute to more migration. Um, and so the, the idea that the Biden administration is gonna focus on root causes is actually another cause for concern. In particular, you know, there's a lot of sort of consensus around fighting corruption, dealing with corruption. I do not want to say that corruption is not a problem in Central America, but I think coming from the United States, a focus on corruption is sort of neoliberalism in another name, because the solution to corruption in terms of development aid is to funnel everything through not the government, to further weaken public institutions, to further put things into the hands of uh, private entities and mostly US-led NGOs, which uh, I think exacerbate the underlying structural issues um, instead of solving anything. So I think we have time for one last question. Uh, I know that Lacey has another talk in her busy agenda. So I just wanna be respectful with her time. Uh, it says, I'm particularly interested in how we understand the forced migration of young people from Central America and the ways they subsequently rationalize as Lacey, as Lacey noted, and therefore criminalize as a threat to US imperialism and capitalism. How is this fear of anarchism and communism coming from the region still informing and structuring the colonial and carceral logic of public schools, not only located in historically Central American neighborhoods in the US, 
but also schools that have large concentrations of Central American youth. Any thoughts? I'm not an expert on any of these things, but you know, I think carceral logics play a role in the experience of Central American migrants at every stage and, and have for a long time. Um, I think about the fact that the one um, set of guidelines that we have about how the US government treats children under federal custody, that that came from a class action lawsuit of mostly Central American youth who were detained <clears throat> in the early 1980s, um, detained, unable to uh, have uh, reunification with their families when they were here, if they were undocumented because they refused to give them to anyone who wasn't their parent. Policies that they just kind of came up with on the spot, um, placing young people in, in detention in in spaces with unrelated adults, uh, all, all sorts of abuses that they went through. Um, and it took a 12 year process of litigation to get to the settlement, the Flores Settlement Agreement that, that continues to be the only set of rules that many administrations haven't followed and, ha and the Obama and Trump administrations tried to overturn because part of what those guidelines state is that people, children cannot be detained for more than a certain length of time. And we know that they are being detained for much longer than that in many cases. Um, so that that's just kind of the, the starting point when people arrive, that's one of the first experiences that many Central American children have had from the 1980s and on. This, this was also true of, of Haitians who had a similar, similar history. Um, and so it's, it's not surprising, especially just with the little bits that I know about schools in areas um, where working class and poor immigrants live, that there, there is the same kind of logic, the racialization of especially boys, I think, from Central America, the way that Amelia just mentioned, right, um, leads teachers. I've been working with a few grad students doing work in schools where teachers already have these preconceived notions about who these these teenage boys are, and they're not perceiving them as just another student. They're perceiving them as people who are likely dangerous, will become dangerous soon, um, people who are, you know, damaged goods in a sense, right? So, so those are some of the connections that I'm seeing. It's not an area that I've done research in. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lacey, uh, Amelia, Jason, for this uh, amazing webinar. When Elizabeth Kolsky and Reina Soto reached me out to organize this panel uh, on Central American migrations, and they let me choose three scholars, it was so easy to just look at your work, uh, look at your activism, look at your commitment, your research, uh, the different kind of struggles that you have been uh, facing on different stages of your career, the kind of art work that Jason has been doing also in connection with migration, the kind of forensic work that Jason has been doing with uh, Colibri Center, the accompaniment of Emilia from Vitalia, of the families of the Central American caravans, and Lacey, well, the kind of work that you have done in the Central American community in Los Angeles is just like an amazing, and amazing accomplishment. So I'm very proud that you were all here today. So we can also recognize the work that you have done uh, in, in the Central American studies field and migration field. So I'm just gonna let my, my colleague Elizabeth Kolsky to say a few words to close the event, but thank you, Jason, Lacey, Amelia, it has been a pleasure to have you here in this amazing webinar.